right. Are we ready, ready to get started? Yeah. Hmm? Go for it. Oop, some nice trilobites there on the box. Gotta love that. All right, so um, welcome to Science Circle panel discussion. I think this is our fourth um, presentation in this format of a um, panel discussion. Uh, they've been a lot of fun. Um, we uh, did a, uh, an event on uh, the Fermi paradox about where are the aliens. And um, uh, we also did a presentation about um, science fiction movies, which was a lot of fun. And I know there was another one, which I can't think of now. Um, um, but uh, today we're going to uh, um, enjoy uh, a nice uh, substantive scientific discussion. Um, our topic today is the Cambrian explosion. So this relates to the history of Earth and life on Earth um, for, you know, about four billion years. Life on Earth was really limited to single-celled creatures and colonies of creatures. And um, as the chemistry of the Earth and the geology of the Earth changed, um, more complex forms of life began to appear um, about 541 million years ago. So the age of the Earth is about four and a half billion years ago. So we're talking about four, 541 million years ago. So really pretty recent in the history of the Earth, but extremely ancient in the history of life. Um, very interesting things began to happen uh, as revealed by the fossil record uh, to life on Earth. And we have with us today to kind of walk us through this extremely interesting period, two excellent panelists um, to my immediate left, I guess, is um, uh, uh, Alex Hastings, who uh, is an actual working scientist um, uh, in this particular field, paleontology and geology. Um, he is the Fitzpatrick Chair of Paleontology at the Science Museum of Minnesota and an assistant curator of, um, uh, or I should say has been the assistant curator of paleontology at the uh, Virginia Museum of Natural History and um, is a member of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology and the Geological Society of America. And uh, next to Alex um, is Day Miami. Um, uh, I think who is known to us here in the science circle. Um, he's an educator at Franklin County High School in Virginia, um, a scientist research associate with the Virginia Museum of Natural History. His fields of expertise include paleontology and geology. Um, he teaches earth science and um, uh, so, um, also uh, has um, uh, a keen interest in um, virtual world learning and is the CEO of Educational Virtual Worlds. So um, I think as you can see, we just have an outstanding panel here to um, for this topic. And with that, uh, with those opening remarks, I would now like to turn the discussion um, over to Day Miami, who is going to help provide set a little bit of context for the Cambrian explosion. Take it away. Okay, thanks, Baragon. Um, appreciate your comments, and I greatly appreciate Alex Hastings coming back to uh, join me on the panel. Um, he started off with a fantastic discussion of Titanoboa, and I'm hoping that he'll be able to come back and join us again um, in the future. We were talking about how one of the things we might want to consider for Science Circle is a discussion of various museums and collections that are available. We talked about there's a nice collection at the Virginia Museum of Natural History um, and maybe about the one that's in Minnesota. Um, the other thing that we've been working on um, is you notice there are two chairs up here. We originally planned to have three and um, I was this past week, uh, past two weeks, I've been trying to get Shuhai Zhao from uh, Virginia Tech 
um, State University um, here in Virginia to come join us. And he is, I consider him uh, one of the experts on the planet on pre-Cambrian, Cambrian transitions. Um, he's done some amazing research. Uh, he's done work in Beijing. Uh, he actually got his bachelor's from Beijing University and his, his PhD from Harvard. And he has joined Second Life, and I think he has an interest in Science Circle as well. I sent him some information that Chantel gave me. Uh, he is at a conference this weekend, so I think he's got trouble getting here. But uh, a suggestion I would make is if we can get Shuai in Science Circle to do a Cambrian Explosion Part 2, and I'm sure Shuai would give us a lot more information about this topic. Um, so with that said... <clears throat> What I want to do is I talked with Alex uh, this week by email, and we tried to figure out how it would be the best way to organize it. One of the things that I suggested was um, I would start with a little bit of an historical discussion about the Cambrian uh, explosion um, and a little discussion of the development of the geology, stratigraphy, and paleontology. And then Alex is going to talk about... Um, uh, the, the Vendian, which is the latest interval of geologic time in the Precambrian, and some of the organisms there. We've got some slides to show off. And then I thought we would uh, open it up to questions and maybe talk about uh, some of the driving mechanisms, either atmospheric or environmental, that may have led to the explosion of life um, at the very beginning of the Cambrian. So um, you can tell I sort of wing things a little bit. I had hoped to get some slides at Alex's, and it just didn't happen. Um, so what I did was I threw out some prims in front of me. And let me see if I can make this full bright. There we go. Now you can see a little bit better. Um, the box that I just turned on um, is a picture. And we've got Dave's voice is distorting. Can he turn down his mic volume? All right. Let me see if I can do that. So um, I know where it is. It's in here. Whoops. Uh, voice. All right, is that any better? Um, Scissor G, I turned down my volume. Is that any better? Not really. Okay, how about that? So I'm afraid I turned down any more. Um, or what I can do is I'm on a headset. Um, is that any better if I swing the mic away? We should have done a voice check. Probably too close to the mic day. All right. Like I said, I've swung the maybe a little. I still have a regret. It's sort of congestion that I have. So uh, fortunately, I'm not going to be speaking. Okay, that's a little better. Okay, good. Um, like I said, I'm just going to make some opening comments, and then and then Alex uh, voices sound much clearer. So anyway, uh, the box I just lit up is a picture of Olin Ellis, and for many years, Olin Ellis was considered the definition of the beginning of the Phanerozoic, the Age of Life, or the Cambrian. And uh, scientists, when they found this fossil, um, said, "Yeah, this is the beginning of it all." And if you think about it, in the Precambrian. Um, which goes from about 4.5 billion to somewhere around 540, uh, 545. We're going to talk about why there's a discrepancy. Um, you have mainly just single-celled algae and bacteria. There's some algal stromatolites, but very simple organisms. And then up until about the 1940s, people said, hey, once you hit the Cambrian, this 543 mark, um, you get this explosion of organisms. You get advanced trilobites with eyes and segmentation and so on. And there was a there was a paper published back in 1972 in the New York Paleontological Society notes entitled From Whence Came All These Critters? And uh, basically it brought up, you know, why was there this huge radiation of different organisms right at the Cambrian? And there have been a couple of theories that we can we can get into later. What's interesting, once you get into the 1960s, uh, geologists started to examine uh, the, the early Cambrian rocks, and what they found is that Olinellus is not the oldest fossil okay, that's been found. In fact, there were trilobites that were found below Olinellus, indicating that there were older trilobites than this thing. Right? And um, when I worked at the museum, uh, Virginia Museum of Natural History, I got a chance 
to examine some of these specimens. I'm going to turn this guy on next. All right, this is an archaeocyathid. It's believed to be related to primitive sponges and so on. Um, you find them um, scattered throughout. They call this the small shelly fauna that's below uh, Olinellus. And you get some really weird fossils. There's one called Solatella that, that everybody has fun with. Uh, because all it is is these cone-shaped fossils that you find in association with archaeocyathids and, and simple trilobites. And I don't think anybody knows what these arc, what these Saltella cone-shaped things are. Um, some people have suggested that um, some people have suggested that they were uh, uh, conulards, which were related to jellyfish today. Perhaps they were mollusks and related to cephalopods. Um, some members of the USGS want to put them in a whole separate phylum. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's interesting that there's been a lot of work done on the Cambrian. Uh, a lot of the problems that we had with the pre-Cambrian Cambrian transition is that there just wasn't a lot of careful field work that was done um, until you start getting into, I would say, the late part of the 20th, 20th century, early 21st century, where a number of geologists started to meet and look at different ways of of establishing where, where are we going to put the boundary, what are the fossils like. I was just at Virginia Tech, and uh, Shuai said that the latest uh, definition of the pre-Cambrian Cambrian boundary, they've now put it at 543 million years old, and they're defining it on the base of a trace fossil, some simple burrows of this organism that uh, burrowed into the sediment is, uh, is what they're using as the, as the official definition of the uh, Cambrian, pre-Cambrian boundary. All right, so um, that gives you a little, uh, historical background as to, um, you know, over 100 years as to what people considered the, uh, the fossils associated with this. And uh, now what we're going to do is Alex will talk a little bit about some of the more recent discoveries and the Vendian, which is the latest geologic time period that not only last one described, but also the very end of the pre-Cambrian. So I'm going to turn off my mic, and I will let um, Alex take it from here. Um, actually, uh, Alex, if you don't mind, uh, hmm? I, may, I inter may I interject a, a question before, uh, before you begin? So sure. one of the things I'm curious with uh, the Archaeocytha um, cones, is it um, – is what's are, are, were these animals mobile? Um, one of the things that I think is interesting about the Cambrian was the increase in mobility of animals. So uh, is, it, is it thought that uh, the Archaeostitha were stationary, or did they have uh, some ability to, to move? My understanding is they were attached to the seafloor. If you look carefully at the pictures in the reconstruction, they have a simple root system. They yes. just um, they attach the bottom. They're simple filter feeders. They have set to in the cone that allows water to go in and take out oxygen and, and food. And then right. I think, Alex, you want to talk about the mobility issue? Certainly organisms were mobile by the time they get to the Cambrian. Well, yes, no, so these are animals, they're not plants. They're for the archaeocyathids. Yes, that's right. They are animals. And one of the reasons mobility is interesting is because it, as my understanding, is it kind of leads to the advent of predators, which uh, really put pressure on life forms to diversify and find new strategies. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alex. Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, Bill maybe can help out with uh, some moving the slides forward a bit, and that should kind of help um, visualize things as we're going here. Um, so uh, I wanted to kind of give a little bit of um, the background even before this to kind of give you a sense of um, kind of what uh, the world was leading into this. So you have, you know, several billion years history leading into it. Um, so, Bill, uh, do you mind moving the next slide forward? There we go. Um, so you're going way, way, way back to uh, the beginning of Earth, uh, more or less when there's still kind of the, the crust itself is forming around there. There's, uh, there's no life whatsoever um, for the first, you know, half billion-ish uh, years of Earth's existence. Um, that's uh, been referred to as the Hadean after, of course, Hades and inhospitable landscape. 
uh, that lasted for quite some time as kind of things were starting to. Um, and Bill, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, and then that launches us into uh, the Archean, which is a really long period of time in Earth's history, but that's when uh, the first signs of life actually start to come. That's kind of been some arguments exactly what that date is. Um, it's typically a little bit younger than 4 billion years ago, but uh, still very, very early in life's history. And a lot of that is um, kind of bacteria or even uh, simpler organisms. Um, but one of the things that really has been the best fossil evidence uh, by far for this early period of life uh, is a fossil called a stromatolite, which is uh, created from bacteria or cyanobacteria. Um, and it's this kind of, uh, not technically an algae, but this kind of algae looking um, Thing that would kind of crust over a layer and then it would kind of build up mud over time and they build up another layer on top of that and over and over again and it creates this kind of mushroom style um, so we got a picture of a, a fossil in the bottom right there on the screen um, and these in cross-section you can kind of see these layers and they're really distinct from the sediment around them and they're kind of our, our best evidence of life from this time Crazily, even though these things go back billions of years, there actually are places on Earth where they're still alive. Um, so the picture in the top there is from Sharks Bay, Australia, which is one of just a handful of places where these stromatolites can still be found. Um, they can live in really um, strange environments, so they can tolerate very, very saline waters um, where a lot of other things can't, and that's typically where they still exist because there aren't uh, any, there isn't anything around to eat them because nothing else can live in that environment. Um, so another place where you can find them are these uh, hypersaline lakes in the Bahamas, like on land itself. Um, but they're very, very rare in only a few circumstances. Anyway, so uh, they uh, <clears throat> were photosynthesizing, essentially. Um, so they were able to um, basically work in this pre-oxygen atmosphere uh, and since they were around for billions of years and had no uh, had nothing eating them, uh, they generated a lot of the oxygen that we have in the atmosphere today over this massive period. Um, Bill, can you go to the next slide? Um, and then that leads into the Proterozoic. Now, the Proterozoic um, is a kind of large chunk of time that goes all the way up to the Cambrian that we're about to is the subject of this uh, section here. <clears throat> and in that time, you see um, even more uh, high abundance of these um, oxygen-creating uh, bacteria. Um, but for most of that time period, they're still really, really, really simple forms of life. Um, one of the really great uh, parts of this is actually right here in Minnesota. Um, we have a lot of the banded iron formations, which is a picture on the uh, left. Uh, which is this, can be this really nice, beautiful red patterning. And that's where um, basically because now there's oxygen in the environment, uh, iron actually will rest, whereas before this it doesn't really because they're not exposed to oxygen. Um, and you see these in these kind of stromatolite-rich beds there, so um, it's a, another good indication of how we got uh, the atmosphere that we have today, and that's uh, largely due to life. Uh, um, but everything was really, really simple. You have basically just bacteria around, and that's really about it for billions of years. Um, and then, um, basically, when the Cambrian explosion came around, life got really, really complex. And for a long time, um, that was thought to have been kind of the defining boundary of, of life, and especially complex life. Um, so the period starting at the Cambrian, at 541, is the uh, Phanerozoic, so that's the time of life. Um, and before that, it's this kind of ancient... It was thought that um, there really wasn't much to complexity in life before this time. However, much more recently, um, there have been a lot of discoveries in uh, what's, what's been called the Vendian, is also the Ed Aaron, um, even before the Cambrian, where you're starting to get fairly complex life. Now in this scenario, so we've got kind of reconstruction in the right there. Um, they're not really plants, they're not, they're kind of animal-ish, 
Um, but they're this weird group uh, or several groups of organisms that um, still had fairly large body size. So some of these got maybe a foot long. Um, I think a, a couple got a little bit bigger than that. Most are a bit smaller. Um, where you have this kind of shallow marine ecosystem where you actually have uh, things that are doing a little bit of photosynthesizing on a, on a bigger scale. Um, you also have things that are probably eating detritus, so things kind of floating in the water. Um, still nothing that's like eating each other, so you really don't have predators yet. Um, so nowhere near the complexity of life that you see later on, but we're actually starting to flesh out this larger view of life and kind of building complexity over time. This is something that's really um, boomed a lot in just the last, uh, say, 20 years, uh, which is relatively short from the, the grander. Um, oh, right, I should be looking at our uh, questions here. Do do wonder when the mitochondria got captured by the cells like we have today. That is a great question in terms of like how eukaryotes developed. Um, we This would have been prior to this Ediacaran period, um, but uh, that still only narrows it down to a billion years of time. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, good, solid kind of in on that. Uh, another kind of parallel to that with mitochondria is also um, the, the actual um, ability to photosynthesize in plants, so having those um, chloroplasts that are actually doing that action in the scenario there. Um, do, do, do. Oh, right, and this is uh, so someone mentioned, oh, Baragon, right. Uh, deeper water creatures couldn't photosynthesize that the, um, got nutrient by osmosis. Um, there's a lot of kind of alternative ways to get energy. Um, in terms of things like these Edicarans and, and, and uh, a lot of these cyanobacteria, we're talking about things that are in fairly shallow water, so that uh, sunlight wouldn't have been a huge problem there. Um, I but together, exactly. Um, so, uh, and this seems to have been kind of where the most uh, kind of boom of complexity of life came in. Uh, in the shallow marine. Um, let's see. Uh, Bill, do you mind going to the next slide? Awesome. All right. So the Cambrian represents the uh, very beginning of that Phanerozoic. So it's uh, kind of still has the name sticking around of being kind of the, the time of life. Um, and the Cambrian itself uh, ran for, uh, what is that, about six odd years. Um, and a uh, million years. Um, and in this um, kind of relatively narrow packet of time, we go from um, still fairly uh, simple forms of life uh, like the Ediacaran fauna to really, really complex uh, scenarios where you have that full ecosystem is flushing out with um, small predators, you got scavengers, you have larger predators, at least for the environment there. Um, and you get this uh, really, really cool experimentation period of life where um, you actually establish several main groups of organisms all within a relatively short time period, but they're doing a lot of fun and interesting and, uh, at least by our modern perspective, weird uh, things all at once, um, all very, very rapidly. Can you go to the next one, Bill? So, all right, so this is, this might be a little bit hard to read, but basically this is just um, kind of an evolutionary tree uh, showing this time here. So basically in the light green, you've got um, kind of the, the time of the Cambrian, and what you got are kind of several uh, major evolutionary lines popping in uh, more or less as soon as that boundary happens. Um, so you're getting things like sponges and arthropods and uh, mollusks, broadly speaking. Dinoderms and all these um, really, really critical groups to uh, modern ecosystems that uh, you really didn't have before that. And then from there, they start expanding and rating it into many other groups there. Um, this figure also calls out one really, really significant um, time or significant uh, geologic formation, the Burgess Shale, which is that white line there. You'll see there's a bunch of little yellow dots there. Those are keys in where um, kind of more radiations are happening within the time period. Now, this is a rock formation 
exposed in uh, Western Canada, where they've just had really, really phenomenal fossilization there, where you're getting soft tissue preservation of these delicate little creatures, but across the entire ecosystem. So you're getting all the weird and cool things all together in one scenario. You can really flesh out what the... Can you go to the next one, Bill? Um, so to kind of set the scenario there um, for what the world would have looked like, um, it's uh, pretty heavily flooded a lot. Um, so you have uh, the massive Panthalassic Ocean um, occupying uh, a large part of the world as well as the Iapetus. Um, you got a lark, and then you got your kind of, this is all pre-Pangea, I should add. Um, you got massive landmass kind of over on the, the eastern part of, or Atmosphere. Um, if you're looking at North America, that's more or less the thing in the middle here. And uh, what you'll notice is there's an outline uh, that's got uh, shallow seas around a landmass there. And that's basically where we're finding a lot of um, really great Cambrian fossil sites in those shallow seas around the ancient continent, uh, much, much smaller North America that existed back then. So, uh, the Burgess Shale is kind of very much in that area, and interestingly, if you want to find other really good um, Cambrian fossil sites, you often kind of flip around over to like Nova Scotia and eastern Canada. Um, part of the reason why Canada has a really good fossil record this far back is that uh, the Canadian Shield is um, kind of the basic uh, kind of uh, nucleus to the North American continent. So it has the oldest landmass, um, and therefore it's got. Um, oldest uh, potential for these deposits to build. Um, so Canada has a bit of a, a priority on uh, really great Cambrian fossils, especially compared. Uh, can you go to next? And I will try and catch up on some of the questions. Yeah, let's see. Uh, let's see, there used to be a lot more oxygen in the atmosphere, which allowed the dinosaurs to get so big as theorized that after the flood, ooh, kind of huge atmosphere, water didn't previously like, <laughs> so much there. Um, let's see, I'll just broadly talk about, um, oxygen. Uh, so at, um, there have been times certainly when, uh, oxygen has, has kind of increased and decreased, um, and this is thought to have kind of helped out particularly, uh, certain kinds of groups to, to be more productive. Um, oxygen tends to favor, um, things that, um, absorb oxygen in different ways as well. So, uh, one of the heydays, uh, is actually after the Cambrian, uh, you've got the Carboniferous period, which is basically when you get, uh, most of our, the, carbon in the, the coal deposits built up. And uh, in that time, you see arthropods, so like um, centipedes and millipedes and uh, kind of really, really large spiders, things that were able to get much, much bigger and uh, a greater abundance because of the higher oxygen. The way they absorb oxygen is through their exoskeleton. So there's actually a limit on how big they can get based on uh, the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, that does translate to water as well, um, and that may have uh, played a role into this, but I don't know that it's all that well understood as far as kind of um, something as specific as oxygen level Cambrian, because that's quite a bit further. And in it. Um, so this slide here is just kind of highlighting a couple of the uh, uh, iconic uh, animals from the Cambrian period. Um, the top left one there is Anomalocaris. Uh, that was a predator. Um, you can actually see next to that you've got a human being there and you've got Anomalocaris next to it. It's the um, smaller part there. So they're a good size. It was, um, I think it was the largest predator of its day. Um, it's um, in this kind of really weird obscure group um, and it had these two uh, prehensile appendages coming off its face there that would have actually been used to grab things like trilobites, bring that up to the mouth, um, and uh, be able to crunch it down. Um, there is a few different kinds there, um, and uh, they seem to have been sort of the, quote, lions. Of 
Uh, another fun oddball is Opabinia below that. Um, and has a little bit of a similar body plan, except that instead of having these two kind of prehensile organs on its front, um, it has this kind of long proboscis um, where it has this kind of uh, sort of teeth-like projections at the end of a trunk, um, and that would have been flexible and able to kind of grab stuff, so it could have rooted around in uh, sediment, kind of off uh, small creatures and eating them directly. Um, and neither one of these really has any uh, close relatives alive today. Um, one of the other fun ones is Hallucinogenia up in the top right. Uh, this one is um, kind of a, uh, it's essentially a worm. Um, but it had these uh, big, long uh, projections off of it. And uh, for the longest time, uh, they did not have a head. Uh, it wasn't until just a few years ago that they finally found one with a head preserved. And it's this weird kind of like almost cartoonish, uh, just like two little dots there with a, a mouth. Um, and it's uh, kind of a, it, it looks very docile in a way. It's kind of interesting. Um, but this is uh, essentially such a, a weird group that has kind of its own line of, of worm evolution, not really getting through segmentations. It makes them. Um, and uh, the last one I wanted to call off, call out here was uh, Pacaya. Pacaya is uh, particularly important because it is a very, very early relative of vertebrates. Um, so in a lot of ways, um, this is our great, 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 great ancestor going all the way back to this early boom in, in life at the Cambrian. Um, and this is very, very uh, simple in that you're basically getting the same kinds of segmentations, like an early form of uh, the spinal column. A lot of uh, times this kind of gets folded into the larger grouping chordata that we belong to. Uh, but before you get to true vertebrates, and certainly before you get to anything having true bones. Um, but that important style of segmentation that we now have in our own backs um, really has its basis way, 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 way back to uh, this fossil site uh, in Canada. And there have been a few other kinds of relatives of these found in a few other places in the world. Um, so I... Seeing there's a bunch of stuff here, I'm going to try and catch up on some of this. Um, Alex, can I jump in a little bit? Yes, please, On absolutely. the oxygen question, that go back. Yes, go for um, it. What I think is really crucial that people understand is the Earth's atmosphere was pretty much devoid of oxygen when it formed, and that was a good thing. Um, are people familiar with the Miller-Urey experiments that were done in the 50s? Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah, but, but yeah. Go ahead. Mel and Yuri uh, were two scientists at my alma mater, University of Chicago, that's why I keep bringing them up, about how they had this large glass container and they put Precambrian gases like methane, sulfur, ammonia, and so on in there, and they ran electric current through them with water, and they got some simple organic compounds out of them. And the argument that if there had been oxygen around when these first organic compounds uh, came into the oceans, they would have just been blown to pieces since oxygen is so reactive. So it's probably a good thing that um, that there wasn't much oxygen around. And then through photosynthesis of algae, stromatolites, and so on, we progressively go towards an oxygen-rich environment. And um, you didn't talk much about the Vendian, the Ediacaran fauna or the Vendian organisms. Um, they've been found in Mexico, Russia, Southern Australia, and just uh, fill that out a little bit. Uh, some really bizarre things. In fact, in many cases, we don't have modern analogs to even compare them with. Um, you know, they, they give them terms like the bilatera, meaning that they have bilateral symmetry or the radiata. Um, maybe they were like jellyfish or, or worms. Uh, we really don't know because they're so soft body. Um, but there are definitely some kind of weird transition that's going on between very simple cell bacteria and more complex life. And Ori is I am and me about a question about that I threw into General Trad about whether mitochondrial uh, or DNA could have come from Mars and it's a little span panspermia theory. Do you, do you want to say anything about it? I'm I'm a little skeptical about that. Especially about since about panspermia? The, yeah, about that. Yeah. So we got how do you feel? I, about I can talk that? a little bit. Um so 
Uh, just to give you guys the background on, on panspermia, and you kind of already hinted at this, Bill, but um, basically you've got uh, the idea that uh, life did not actually originate on Earth. It originated elsewhere and basically found its way through space rock, essentially, onto Earth, and then that sparked life here on Earth. Um it's a really neat idea. It's going to be very difficult to prove anything like that um, because we're going so far back in time. Um, and uh, really what you would need is something like if there was life on Mars that then sparked life on Earth. Um, hypothetically, if you could find life on Mars, um, then you could look at what the levels of similarity between the two are. And if they're... Um, highly similar, then that would be a good um, good support for that idea. It still doesn't get you to proof. Um, so it's, 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 uh, it's a cool idea. I don't know that um, it's necessary or that you'll really be able to uh, definitively show that um, in my lifetime anyway. Um, um, yep. uh, Alex, uh, yep. uh, this is Baragon. Uh, just to sure. interject maybe a fun little uh, thing about uh, panspermia. At one time, Francis Crick, um, one of the co-discoverers of, of DNA, um, was an advocate of panspermia. His reason was the um, abundance of molybdenum uh, in biological processes on Earth, sort of a disproportionate re requirement for molybdenum compared to its abundance um, you know, uh, on, in on Earth's rocks and so forth, um, and so he thought, well, maybe life evolved on a planet that was rich in molybdenum and, and came here. So, just thought I would toss that out um, as mm -hmm. that, that there is a high, high profile scientist who, at least one time, uh, was uh, interested in the panspermia idea. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the whole kind of tiny subfield of uh, astrobiology is a really fascinating one. And a lot of it ends up uh, stemming from kind of the ideas behind life would, how life would originate. Um, in, in, I mean, it had to have started somewhere at some point under some circumstances. So even if you're kind of looking at life originating here or life originating on other planets, uh, how exactly do you do that? And that's where kind of original URA stuff comes how that would um, physically have happened. Um, but uh, it's definitely an area that is a, has a lot of, of room to grow on and that there's a lot that we don't yet understand how exactly life itself got started. Um, let's see, so I'm finding all kinds of cool comments, little green worms, nitrogen oxides. Cool, cool. Um, do, 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 do. Amino acids. We're talking early life. <laughs> I'm trying to catch up. Ah, so there's a uh, one comment here on uh, life on Europa. Uh, Krebs cycle jump from Europe to Europa can exist. Um, so this is one of those where I think we, um, you know, whenever we are able to to send something to, to land on Europa and actually start uh, looking into details. So places like that might actually be really good circumstances for finding life on other, um, life on, on other places. Um, and uh, let's see, the big contenders are uh, Europa, uh, Titan, and, uh, and, and possibly Mars out there. Um, I do know that... Uh, um, they have included a lot of equipment that was uh, designed to detect signs of life on Mars. Um, none of them came definitively to, to any conclusions on that. Um, and there was enough pushback because uh, they didn't get very solid results on anything um, that, you know, instead maybe we should try and get what information we're a little more uh, likely to find. So. Uh, kind of the larger pushes that uh, the Mars work has been on different geological factors. Um, and uh, anyway, so there's there's other cool things to learn about Mars uh, that's been kind of uh, a little bit of a pushback on the, the search for life on Mars specifically. 
Um, so this is Barragon again, uh, just to kind of refocus this on the Cambrian. <laughs> right, uh, one right. of the things, one of the things that uh, interests me about it um, is the emergence of predators. Um, it seems to me that um, uh, the change uh, that the emergence of predators created kind of an arms race where the prey had to adapt to predators and that this was a, uh, a tremendous engine uh, in the explosion of diversity in the Cambrian. And I kind of like to get uh, both of your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, so absolutely. So this is um, part of also kind of why I, I brought in things like Anomala Karis here. So um, when you're looking at that Edia Karen uh, fauna, the one that I was talking about before, you have it's fairly simplistic and you don't have a large you don't have nearly the, the complexity of an ecosystem that you see in the Cambrian. And having predators really, really um, increases your natural selection enormously. So you start seeing all these fun adaptations, not only in predators, but also in uh, these prey forms. You start seeing things like uh, trilobites that have this kind of thickened exoskeleton, so they're a little bit more armored. You see stuff like this hallucinogenia here that's got... Um, Kind of these large spikes here so it's kind of helping avoid sort of uh, predation um, and you start seeing things um, kind of taking on different modes of life entirely so things that are um, actually free moving and they're not nearly as sessile so um, things that are able to move actively and with purpose that you don't really see prior to this so you have this kind of Potential thing that's maybe like a little bit of a jellyfish, but jellyfish are mostly just kind of uh, reactive and a little bit more passively moving around, where something like the anomalous caris there on the top left is actively seeking out things. The other interesting thing that that does is then it creates not only um, this new natural selective pressure uh, in order to help drive evolution and help kind of push things into new directions, um, but it also starts bringing in um, intelligence in a way. So you start seeing things that have to start to think a bit about the environment that they're living in. And um, so something like a predator has to be able to find stuff. So there's at least some kind of uh, function that's happening there that you don't really see prior to this. And that shows up in prey as well that has to avoid predators. So as you're saying, that predator really is a major, um, just the fact that there are predators as a major evolutionary drive that really got kick-started in the Cambrian. And basically, as soon as that happens, geologically speaking, um, you have this giant, giant boom in diversity, and then you end up establishing a lot of major evolutionary lines that then become successful enough to have uh, modern relatives that are large parts of ecosystems today. And a lot of that is thanks to uh, the dawn of predators. Bill, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, we already talked a little bit about the role of oxygen and how certainly by five, by the beginning of the Cambrian, um, you know, we have an oxygen-rich environment which is going to support more advanced life like you're seeing on the slides. One other thing that um, recently has been discussed uh, that was very important was the snowball earth theory as a way of driving the diversification. Uh, Paul Hoffman at Harvard has argued that Towards the end of the Precambrian, about a billion years ago, the whole planet froze over, and life was hanging on by a thread. Um, you had very simple organisms that were around, huddled around hydrothermal vents trying to stay cool, uh, I mean, just trying to stay warm. And it wasn't until uh, the planet thawed out from this uh, snowball uh, period that, uh, that advanced Mesozoic life could uh, expand. So I think there's a number of things that we can point to and look at as to why you got more complicated uh, life uh, occurring, and we're still we're still researching it. Uh, even here in Virginia, uh, the Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy, uh, David Spears, who's the director of that, has asked me, "So do we have any Precambrian fossils in Virginia?" We don't even know the answer to a basic question like that. We know they're in North Carolina because we found them. I've tried looking in some of the, the late Precambrian slates around the Virgilina district in the south part of uh, Virginia and haven't found anything because we're, you get into metamorphic rocks. 
but there's still a lot of basic field work that still needs to be done to answer these questions. And we've been making progress, but we certainly need more of it. There's a lot of slate in the Virgil line of district to look through to see if there's anything there. Um, one of the um, uh, factors that I've heard about uh, for the Cambrian explosion uh, was as we were transitioning, as the earth was transitioning out of the snowball earth phase uh, and the glaciers began to melt um, and exposing the rock underneath them that had been trapped by the glaciers. But this created, this resulted in lots of erosion, which added <clears throat> lots of minerals and nutrients back into the water. So this, in maybe in combination with the oxygen, this new abundance of minerals and nutrients added to the seas as the glaciers melted also contributed to the explosion of life. Well said. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there's definitely a, a consistent tie with uh, climatic shifts, and um, particularly when you're going into kind of warming phases, you typically do see uh, higher amounts of diversity, at least on kind of geologic time scales. Um, and uh, Certainly something like uh, Snowball Earth, a scenario where you have uh, a very, very cold Earth for a very long period of time, um, would have acted counter to um, something like the Cambrian Explosion would not have occurred in that um, same. Um, so, Bill, I think I had at least one more slide. Do you mind going... Or is that the end? I think there's one more, right? Yeah. Oh, so this is just kind of more specifically about the Burgess Shale. Um, oh, so yes. it just we comes up because it's the Burgess Shale. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, yes, we can't uh, have a discussion of the Cambrian without discussing the Burgess Shale. So I'm glad absolutely. you brought that up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's just uh, what we would call a, a Lagerstätte. Uh, which is uh, actually a, a German term that's now been kind of incorporated into all of paleontology. Basically, it just means uh, it's a site of incredible preservation. Um, it's from the middle Cambrian, so it's not quite at the beginning. Um, so it's about 508 million years ago. Um, and uh, because uh, this unit just preserves such immaculate details, like uh, this is uh, an early form of worm here um, that just has this beautiful kind of feathery tendrils off of it, all of it amazingly preserved. Um, getting these soft tissue organisms from so long ago is uh, just absolutely incredible. So this is a world-class site. I'm pretty sure it actually, no, it's established as a UNESCO World Heritage Site now um, just because it is so critically important to our understanding of uh, the history of life. Um, so it's uh, one of those that's on my bucket list I hope to get to sometime. Um, it's uh, in a, a little bit out there. Um, so it's on kind of the eastern side of British Columbia in uh, western Canada. And Bill, was that the last one? I think that might have been the last slide. Yep, that's the end of it. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure I hit everything. Two. Yeah, the Burgess Shale me. was uh, the discovery of the Burgess Shale and the um, the antiquity of the fossils, outstanding preservation, um, and the diversity of life forms found in the Burgess Shale um, was really the first. That's when, sort of, in, in my understanding, that that's really when the how spectacular the Cambrian explosion was really hit people, like. You know, holy moly, um, look at all of this amazing life that just, you know, all coming out at the right around the same. Absolutely. So um, the the previous slide that had uh, the Namalacaris and the, even the early vertebrates, um, early pre-vertebrate, uh, came from specifically the Burgess Shale. And some of these have only been recognized at this one place because uh, fossil sites Cambrian fossil sites aren't common, and especially uh, Cambrian sites that preserve soft tissue like this are very, very, very rare. Um, so a lot of what we know about that Cambrian explosion came comes specifically from this one place. 
Um, and it's, uh, as you say, it's, it kind of really helps visualize the, the amazingness of, of what they've got there. And there is a group that's working towards kind of visualizing these um, often bizarre looking animals there so you can kind of get a, a greater appreciation for um, kind of what life was like at this time. Um, so I'm looking through for questions. Um, so one point, I think, Baragon, you mentioned uh, eyes uh, more or less come in at the, the Cambrian as well. Um, and this likely also kind of ties into your predation scenario, um, but maybe not exclusively. Um, so if you're imagining something that uh, has to want, has to find something, um, having eyeballs is a really good way of, of finding them, right? So use. Um, even for uh, prey or for, for things that are not predators, having eyes then becomes a really great way of uh, realizing that you've got something you need to get away from, right? That's helping drive uh, another aspect of evolution. And now eyes, of course, are a fundamental part of most ecosystems um, where it ends up being very dependent on kind of, you know, visual cues are, are critically important to uh, all kinds of forms of life and and see now. Um, a lot of there that used is to... thanks to innovations that happened during the Cambrian. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there still is, but didn't there at one time, wasn't there sort of a subspecialty in paleontology of fascination with trilobite eyes because they were advanced and complex and each species had its own sort of different type of eye and so forth? Um, yeah, there is. Um, I, I don't know that it's necessarily stopped, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the compound eyes of Trilobites uh, are particularly advanced, especially for uh, the time in which they uh, came around. Um, and uh, then you get these really weird forms, too, where you've got, like, stalks, where the eyes are actually kind of extended out, and the idea is that um, these things were kind of going into the subsurface a bit, but they still need to be able to see things that are going on above, so they have these kind of eyes that kind of on tubes, more or less, they could... Um, Kind of be a little bit safer under the sediment, but still be able to see. Um, and there's a whole host of complications genetically that go into forming something like. That. Yeah, um, yeah. And you know, even though you're still looking at the you know a few millions of years for a lot of these things to be popping in during the Cambrian, geologically speaking, that's very very soon. And the fact that you have a lot of these things happening um, more or less in tandem. Just showing that these massive or, or massive, um, yeah, overturn in in life and evolution, um, so making the major radiations um, across this uh, shallow marine ecosystem that end up having very very firm, establishing very very firm roots uh, for the rest of uh, life. To me, it suggests that um, even though it seemed that life was relatively static for a long time. Um, sort of underneath the surface, the DNA and our cellular structures were quietly sort of assembling the building blocks for these complex structures uh, to be able to emerge once uh, circumstances were uh, were right for them to. Um, and uh, uh, so that, well, um, one other thought is that all these creatures uh, live in the water and so, and the development of eyes requires light. So, are these creatures essentially sort of shallow water creatures that where the light can still penetrate in, uh, you know, deep enough into the water? So, in terms of like the the Burgess Shale in particular, this is a shallow marine environment where uh, light would have been pretty. It would have been fairly well lit during the day. So, you're looking at something where light is having a, a found impact on kind of that evolutionary drive. So especially when you're looking at things. Uh, it but it's good, also it... kind of helping form the, the basic founding blocks of um, kind of more um, photosynthesizing organisms that are kind of forming that baseline for the ecosystem. And then it kind of scales up to uh, all the way up to, to predators. So um, it seems like the, at least in terms of uh, complexity of life, really came in in these light-rich um, marine environments, um, which is also consistent with the Precambrian 
uh, like the the Vendian, the um, the Rangiomorphs, the the early forms of life. Um, so like the Ediacaran fauna, which is one of the best representatives of that, is um, this uh, shallow marine ecosystem from Australia. Even though you've got forms of life kind of from hydrothermal vents, um, that real boom in uh, complexity of life seems to have come in in the shallow marine environment where light was a major factor. For so, yes, let's talk a little bit about the Ediacaran and the Vendian, um, sort of the, the, uh, the sort of late Precambrian, um, because I think recent discoveries there have shown that maybe the transition uh, to the Cambrian complex animals may not has been may not have been as abrupt uh, as originally thought, and that there uh, there uh, was a population of a, sort of a little more complex animals prior to the Cambrian explosion. So let's explore that a little bit. Um, it's uh, I mean, so the hey, idea can I is jump that on uh, that one. Excuse oh, yeah, me, go ahead, please, please, please. All right. Um, and the reason I want to jump in on this was because I worked with um, Jack Sapkowski in Chicago. He was my evaluator. And one of the things that Jack impressed upon me was how crude our understanding of the Cambrian, Precambrian boundary was back in the 70s and 80s. I remember uh, as, a, as a high school student trying to memorize the geologic time scale, and it was so frustrating because they would put the boundary at 600 million years ago, that it was 575 million years ago, that it was 545 million years ago, that it was 543 million years ago. And I asked Jack about who had done his PhD work on the Cambrian of Canada. And he said, it's just so hard to get good hard data on the Cambrian, pre-Cambrian boundary. And um, they're trying to look at a number of different ways of defining the boundary. Uh, like I said, originally it was defined on the first occurrence of Olin Ellis. Everybody agreed that wasn't going to work. So they tried to look at other ways. They looked at isotope ways of defining it, trace fossil ways. Um, like I said, it took 20, 30 years before we even got or even close to a consensus of opinion as to um, where the boundary should be. And like the comment I just made, I think there's more work to be done. I've talked with some of the geologists down in North Carolina that came to visit the Virginia Museum of Natural History. I told them about what I had found in, in Virginia, and they said, oh, you're too high in the section. You've got to go lower. You've got to find somewhat older rocks. And then they mentioned to me that some of the some of those, quote, pre-Cambrian fossils that they found were in a bed with trilobites, which tells me some of the things from North Carolina aren't even pre-Cambrian. They're Cambrian if it You've got trilobites in them. So there's some serious field work that still, I think, still needs to be done to, re to get the resolution we need to really understand what's going on at this crucial boundary in, in Earth's history. Agreed. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not an, an easy scenario to work in because, you know, there are... Um, Precambrian outcrops, but especially like fossiliferous ones, really aren't that common. And it's, um, particularly ones that are going to have um, preservation good enough where you're, you're getting a good idea of what uh, like an ecosystem is like are even rarer still. Um, so there are opportunities out there, but it's, um, it's, it's not, not going to be a, a simple or easy kind of thing. It's, it would require a good... <laughs> uh, kind of field intensive uh, area of study to kind of get into this more. And there are people who are kind of uh, focusing in on this uh, really fascinating period of life. But uh, as you say, there's quite a bit of room to, to learn new things about it. I think one of the interesting things uh, about this sort of a late Precambrian is that even though it appears that we have found, you know, fossils of actual animals in the Precambrian, um, that is, you know, they're not plants and they're not microorganism colonies. They're something else. They're not photosynthesizing. Um, so they, they must be sort of eating in some way. But I think what's healthy to appreciate is that from the fossil record, it seems like there were relatively few types of animals, maybe a half a dozen types of animals, much, much fewer than we see in Cambrian. Um, and it's also unclear whether or which ones of them might have left descendants. It appears that really most of the few types of animals we know do not leave any descendants. 
Um, so, um, so in terms of kind of the, the, the types that we see in the Cambrian, we do see a lot of these, um, well, things like, uh, arthropods, uh, clearly establishing themselves, uh, around this time. And then, uh, they, you know, obviously have a, a very, very profound, uh, all the way through the system. Uh, there is a little bit of kind of a experimentation area where you're getting these uh, kinds of groups that, um, even though they um, were pervasive for a while, they they did not make it through later mass extinctions. They end up with um, kind of oddballs that uh, don't really have modern relatives. I mean, you got this um, kind of opening up of opportunities uh, where life is kind of trying out different things in a way. Um, and you see this kind of scenario a couple other times in history. It's often after um, like a mass extinction event or a major climate, climatic event. Um, so I'm thinking particularly like after the, the end Permian extinction, which is kind of the biggest of all extinctions. Uh, after that time, you see these um, kind of early forms of uh, particularly what would eventually give rise to things like uh, crocodiles and dinosaurs, but you also get a whole host of other kinds of animals in that vein, uh, trying out different uh, scenarios and not all of them. And um, so especially when you're kind of getting into a new era of life, you tend to have a lot of different forms coming in and then uh, time, a lot of those uh, die out. And, um, end up with a scenario that's uh, distinct, uh, very distinct from the, the earlier forms after those uh, major uh, evolutionary shifts, which are typically uh, driven by uh, major changes in climates um, uh, like mass extinction. All right, very good. Um, I'm sorry to say it looks like we have run out of time, <laughs> already past the hour. Um, so uh, I, I guess we'll have to wrap it up um, so we could keep talking. Um, uh, let's see, um, perhaps uh, maybe if, if there are any uh, group announcements for Science Circle that Chantal would like to maybe post at. And, um, but otherwise, I would like to uh, thank our panelists, uh, Alex and Dave, for really providing us with uh, fantastic expertise um, about this uh, fascinating topic in life. Thank you. Students, we'll give them a round of applause. <laughs> and uh, with that, um, I will bring uh, this session to a close. Thanks again, and good night, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>